we spent some time just really hearing from him this morning. He has some awesome, awesome, awesome nuggets to share, not only as an entrepreneur, but as a human being and as someone who has realized his dreams coming from a place of disadvantage as well and now just really taking off and doing some great things. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please give a warm Jamaican Jam down, bunan on us. Welcome to Stephen Bartlett. This is exactly why you were expelled from school. <laughs> You're incapable of sticking at anything you don't believe in, and you always think you can find a better way. Don't call me, and don't call any of the family until you go back to university. And with that, my very, very angry Nigerian mother hung up the phone. And from that day onwards, at the age of 18 years old, after just one week at university, I didn't speak to my mother for another three years. She vowed not to speak to me if I was to pursue the business idea I had, because coming from a background where she didn't get an education, and where a lot of people who grew up with her didn't get an education in Nigeria, education was the most important thing. And she couldn't see her son drop out of university after just one lecture and pursue an idea <laughs> going very well. But she knew one thing. She knew me well enough to know that I was going to do it anyway. And at 18 years old, that's exactly what I did. I'd been inspired by these really messy physical notice boards all over campus at my university in the week I was there. And I thought it was crazy that in 2011, this is how students at university were communicating with each other when we have the internet. So in my very sort of maybe naive brain, I thought I could turn this into a website. I could bring this online. And I was going to call it Wall Park, a wall that you park things on. That was my idea. I'd never built a website before in my life. And if you ask me the question, you know, who, who am I? Who was I to chase this dream of building this website? I was born in a village in Botswana, in Africa. This photo here you see in the left corner, that's my family in Africa, my granddad, my mother's in the middle there. Growing up in the UK, we moved there, I moved to the UK when I was three years old, moved to a countryside village in the southwest of England. I was the only black kid, I might not be considered as black here, but back home I'm as black as it gets, right? right? I'm the blackest thing in the UK. Um, growing up in a school of 1,500 white kids, being the only black kid, and being the kid that didn't have birthdays or Christmases because my family were virtually bankrupt for my entire life. You know, the front of our house had smashed windows on it in an area where everyone had beautiful gardens. Our grass was this high. I never went on family holidays at all. Not once. The first time I got on a plane, other than coming from Africa, was when I was 21 years old and I put myself on that plane. We had nothing. And all of those things really compounded to create this sense of like inadequacy in me. I felt completely different. I didn't have the money, I didn't have the straight hair, I didn't look the same as all my peers. And I would sometimes, I think, spend a little bit too long fantasizing about how I would become like them. 
I remember one particular day being sat on this wall at the end of my street and seeing this plane go over my head, and I looked down the street that I, that I grew up in, and I saw our house, which was smashed to pieces with the grass this high and fridges and electronics in the gardens. And I looked around at my neighbors, and, I, and, and for me, this plane was a metaphor for a freedom. In my head, everyone that went on a holiday and had these nice things was free, and I didn't understand why I couldn't have those things. And at 18 years old, in that week where I dropped out of university and made that phone call to my mother, here's a photo of what I wrote in my diary. I wrote four goals. Goal number one, I want to be a millionaire before I'm 25 years old. Goal number two, I want a Range Rover to be my first car, right? I didn't even have a driving license, so. But I wanted a Range Rover to be my first car. That's a car that costs about 150,000 pounds, right? Like, a billion dollars out here or something crazy. <laughs> um, I wanted to have a long-term relationship, right? Um, and I wanted to work on my body image because I was incredibly, incredibly skinny at the time. And every single day, from the moment I dropped out, from the moment my mother vowed never to speak to me again, I kept a diary on Facebook, which is still there today. It's private, but sometimes I share it. This is one of those occasions. And you can see the journey of an entrepreneur. I start incredibly enthusiastic with all the delusional belief in the world. And as the days tick on and we get to 16 days and 20 days and 30 days and 300 days, you see things start to test me a little bit. On this particular day here, I, the title of my diary entry was Life is a Roller Coaster. And I talk about the fact that I have 14 pounds left to my name. I don't have a job. I haven't paid my rent for four and a half months. I'm living above a pizza shop in the worst area in the country. My mother's not talking to me. I'm having to dodge the bailiffs who are threatening to come and take the computer that I have, and things are very difficult. On this day, I wrote life, I wrote where am I? I wrote, so much has happened since I last wrote in my diary. Right now I'm in a small dark house in Mossside, which is where all the gun crime takes place in the UK. It's nearly 10 p.m., I can't see a thing, and occasionally, we don't have electricity in the house, and I keep bumping into some guy from Cameroon. Here's a photo I took of my financial situation in an image. All my credit cards and all my bank cards had been uh, voided by the bank. When you don't pay back your overdrafts, when you default on your credit payments, it turns out that you destroy this very interesting thing that I didn't realize I had called a credit rating. And it's really, really hard to repair that. I didn't even know what a credit rating was until I destroyed mine. Here's a photo I took of um, some letters on my desk. These are government letters, which is the government telling me they're going to come and take my stuff. The, the one at the back is probably the closest thing I got to something that sounds like a qualification. It's called a CCJ, a county court judgment. Again, it's when they're, they're threatening to come and take your stuff away. Here's a photo I took of what I was eating when I moved to Moss Side. It's a concoction of basically flour mixed with water. And my brother told me, if you get flour and you mix it with water and you put oats inside it, it can act as a meal rep I'm glad it's funny to you, it wasn't funny to me. <laughs> she sat there eating her chicken, laughing at my oats. <laughs> and here's a photo of the laptop that I was going to build this internet company on. Right? It's missing keys. The charger is sellotaped together. If you look very closely at the wiring, you can see a small silver ball. That's a little Christmas ball ball. And what happened was I didn't have the 10 pounds that I needed to replace the charger, so I would get little pieces of metal and solder them into the wiring, sellotape it up, try it again, and it would usually work for about half an hour before I forgot and tried to move it and it collapsed. And that's the website that I was going to, this is the tools I was going to use to build this company and hopefully get out of my situation. And here's, uh, here's what I did when my laptop stopped working. Here's the back of a pizza box. And what you probably can't see from the back of the room is I've sketched out the different sections that I was going to have on this notice board on my website on the back of these pizza boxes. So you can see I've written jobs, buying and selling, events, accommodation questions. I was sketching out exactly how this website was going to look. And then there was one day, I'm two years in at this point, feels like I'm not making much progress at all. And there was one day where I, I, was, I realized that I needed to actually create a business and go and get a business bank account. So I went off into the city center, and I went to Santander Bank, and I said to Santander, hi, I want to open a bank account. They ran my file and said, you can't open a business bank account. Your credit 
is terrible. You don't even have a personal bank account yourself. I thought, forget you. Walked across the street. Nat West, I want to open a business bank account. They say the same thing. You can't open a business bank account because you've destroyed your credit and we won't even give you a bank account. Fine. Lloyd's Bank, they said the same thing. HSBC said the same thing. Barclays said the same thing. And I didn't really know what that meant. And I remember going home at 19 years old, and probably for the first time in my adult life, I thought it might just be over. I thought maybe my mum was right. And it's the first time I can recall crying my eyes out since the age of maybe 12, on my bed at home, in that boarded up house, because I thought that that was the, the end. I thought that was my limit. And that night, I, I got into bed on my little um, broken up laptop, and I went on YouTube, and as I was falling asleep, I remember it like it was yesterday, it was about 2.30 in the morning, and I'm typing in true documentaries, documentary, whatever. I press play on a documentary I've never seen, in my, I didn't know what it was, just to try and get me to sleep. I press play and I start, um, watching it as I fall asleep. And it was the story of a survival incident that happened in the Andes Mountains in Chile. And it's the story of this rugby team um, called the, the, the Chilean rugby team who were in the final of a rugby tournament. So they chartered a jet and they flew it from where they were to, to Argentina to play in this final. And as they're flying over, all of the rugby team, some of them have brought their friends and family, the pilot misjudged where they were, and he started to descend into the mountains. And what happened was the plane hits the top of the mountain, and it snaps in half. And just by the, the, the luck of, you know, God must have been looking over them that day, it perfectly, to, half of the plane perfectly tobogganed down the mountain into the bottom of the crevice. And there you had the survivors, only half of them survived, about 40 of them, laying at the bottom of this, this mountain in this massive, massive cre crevice with no food, no water, and no way to communicate with the outside world. After five days of eating scraps, trying to eat rubber, trying to eat anything they could, they ran out of food, right? And 10 days in, after running out of food, they managed to hear on a radio from the cockpit that the local authorities have called off the search for them. They hear that nobody is coming. They're in the middle of they don't know where, and nobody is coming for them. And as the days pass, some more unfortunate things happen. They get 10 days, they get to day 20 in the middle of nowhere, and an avalanche comes down the mountain at night and kills half of them. 10 of them are left trapped inside the cockpit. They manage to survive. So there's about 16 of them after that avalanche hit that are still surviving. And one of those people that was left after the avalanche hit was this guy called Nando Peredo. And Nando had come on this rugby trip. He was the, one of the best players in the team. So he decided to bring his mother and his sister with him on the trip. And unfortunately, when the, the plane hit the, the side of the mountain, both of them had died. And a couple of days, about 20 days into the survival experience, they realized something which is quite grotesque for me to tell you, but it's the truth. They realized that if they're going to survive, they have to start eating the bodies of their friends and families. It's the only choice they have. And when you're in really desperate situations, I think your brain can do some pretty tremendous things that you might not expect it to be able to do. And so that's what they do. They start eating the dead bodies of their friends and families. And they go 60 days in this mountain, surviving off the flesh of their friends and family who came on this trip with them. And it gets to a point where Nando realizes that he does not want to have to eat the body of his mum and his sister who accompanied, accompanied him on this journey to watch him play in that final. So he says to his comrades, I'm going to try and just walk to the top of this crevice that we're stuck at the bottom of, and I'm going to look out. And if my calculations are correct, I'll be able to see a village or some grasslands or the city or something. I'll be able to see something. So he takes some flesh, it takes him two and a half days of him and a co his, one of his colleagues walking up the side of this mountain. And when he gets to the top of the mountain, this is the exact view taken 10 years later that he saw. This is the exact view. Nothing. Mountain upon mountain upon mountain upon mountain. 
What he didn't realize from their calculations was the pilot had descended hours earlier, and they were hundreds and hundreds of miles from anything. And Nando looks back down at the crash site, and he can see the bodies of his mum and his sister, and he removes the decision. He says, I'm not going back. I'm going to walk. So his comrade goes back down the mountain. Nando removes the decision. And sometimes people look at the, the real defining moments in their life, and they say, oh, you made a brave decision. You made a tremendously brave decision. People look at my journey, and they, they, you know, they often say, you made this brave decision. But really, I had no decision. There was really nothing brave about it. There was no plan B, because plan A meant too much to me. And that's what Nando found himself in in that situation. And so he walked. And he walked, and he walked, and he walked. And after five days of walking, he got tremendously, tremendously sick. Six days of walking, he can barely walk. He walks for eight days, and at this point, he's crawling through these mountains. Ten days in, after crawling and walking and stumbling, Nando gets to this lake. And by, you know, one might say the grace of God, at the exact moment when he fell by that lake, a guy on a horse called Pereiro came past on a horse the other side of the lake. He saw him collapse there. He got a paper, wrapped it on a stone with a little pencil, threw it across the lake. He wrote the story, and they went back and saved all 16 of Nando's comrades. And all of them that were remaining there survived because of Nando. Within 48 hours, they were all rescued. And for me, again, that's the, this defining sort of lesson that I've learned in my life about the limitations that hold most of us back are really just self-imposed limitations. And when you remove that decision, when something matters more to you than the, you know, people's opinions or what might go wrong if you fail, you can do pretty tremendous things. An even more sort of relatable example that I found out which kind of connects to this happened when I landed in Boston to do a talk last year. And I landed, I went to the gym in the hotel before my, uh, my presentation. And every single day that year, I said to myself, whenever you go to the gym, do four kilometers on the treadmill. So I get to the gym in Boston in this hotel room. I'm running, I'm running, running. I get on there, and I realize that this treadmill doesn't have the distance on it. The distance thing isn't working. But so I just say to myself, well, I know how I feel when I run four kilometers. I'm exhausted every single time. I'm sweating, the room is semi-spinning. So what I'll do is when I feel like that, I'll stop, because then I'll know it's four kilometers, right? So I start running and running and running, and the time's ticking past, and I'm running, and I'm thinking, God, I've been running for a long time here. I need to get off this treadmill soon, because I'm going to be late for my presentation. I'm running, I'm running, I'm running, I'm running. I hit stop when I get to the point where I feel tired like I usually do, and I've run 12 kilometers. And I couldn't get my head around it. How can, when I can't see the distance, I run three times the distance, and I still feel the same, genuinely the same. I felt as exhausted when I ran 12 kilometers as I did the week before when I ran four. And that's because my mind didn't make the decision. My body did. My body made the decision for my body. And really, my mind had been this real limiting factor. My mind had saw four kilometers every time and told me I was tired. And so you start to feel that. If you tell yourself things, you start to feel them. This has been proven throughout psychology. It's not just me and my treadmill. This is how the mind works. And an even more sort of pressing example, you might think this is just humans. But the same thing happens throughout the animal kingdom. If you get an ant and you draw a circle around it, it will think it's trapped. Right? And if you get a pen and you make that circle even smaller, the ant will be convinced that its circle just got smaller. It will not try and go beyond this pen line. The pen line poses no risk to the ant, other than the risk that is perceived in the own ant's mind. And this is, this is again, the, the way that our belief systems work. But the interesting thing is, you can do the same thing with a spider, but there's one point in this video where the spider accidentally runs over the line, and then the pen can never trap the spider ever again. Because it realizes that that limitation was just an illusion in its own mind. It runs over it there, and then the pen stops working. <laughs> you can't trap it anymore. <laughs> and it's free, right? 
The only limits you, you really, really have, and this is something that I came to learn very, very young, are those that you choose to believe. And I, I promise you that every single person in this audience has told themselves how far they can go. You've drawn your own little imaginary pen circle around you, and you've told yourself what you deserve based on who you are, where you came from, and what you look like. And one of the things that you know, they asked me before I came up on stage in an interview I was doing was, you know, this is, we're in Jamaica, which is a developing country. The advantages that I had in some parts of the world aren't the same here. And that's inherently true. No one can dispute that. But I promise you, especially as a kid that grew up in an area where I thought I was at a huge, huge disadvantage because I was the only black kid with no money in, a, in an area of 1,500 white kids, the biggest danger isn't the circumstance, it's believing that the circumstance will forever hold you back. It's the same in school. The biggest danger of getting a D grade on your exam isn't the D, it's letting the D get to you. It's walking around and spending the rest of your life believing that you are a D, and then acting like a D. And when you start acting like a D, you start getting D results. I was telling them, you know, it's, it's very much like YouTube and algorithms and how the internet is programmed. If you watch something on the, the internet, if you focus on something, you get more of that back. And if you go through life thinking that you're a D, walking like a D, you'll, you'll, live, a, you'll leave, live a very, very D-looking life. The biggest danger isn't your circumstance. It's you believing that your circumstance is forever going to hold you back. I promise you that. I promise you that. And I guess in this moment as well, life was asking me this question, which is, how bad do you really, really want it? Did I want it as much as I wanted to be liked? This is one of the forces in the world that holds us back. So much of our potential seems to be trapped behind other people's opinions, family members, loved ones, partners who aren't supportive, people who don't believe in us and then reflect and project that lack of belief in themselves onto us. My roommates, when I dropped out of university and started spending all this time building this crazy website that was going to take over the world, called me weird all the time. And it got to a point where I was about 18 months in, I really didn't have any friends because the walls were so thin, I could hear what they were saying about me. And people say those kinds of things typically because they, they want to pull you back into the herd. They don't want you to get it if they're not getting it. And that's their way of trying to pressure you back into conformity to fall back in line. And the other question I guess life was asking me was, does I, did I want this future, this freedom that I always talked about, more than I wanted my present? Because the truth is you can't have both at the same time. And that's really what sacrifice is. I couldn't have my comfy life in, you know, in, the, in Plymouth with my mum and my dad and whatever else if I wanted my own greatness. I had to decide which one it was gonna be and unapologetically go in that direction without the decision. And also, in the small amount of time that I have on this planet, in a world that has so much opportunity and wonder to be experienced, was I really going to allow this one life that I get to live on this amazing planet, this gift that I've been given, be distinctly average and unfulfilling? Absolutely not. And, you know, you might call it serendipity or luck or... If you believe in a God, you might call it God. But the day after watching that documentary in that bed that night, I got up out of bed, and I went to bank number 11. And bank number 11, just like Nando in the mountains found the guy on the horse that saved him on the 11th day, bank number 11 said yes. And that's how my business started. Co-op gave me a chance. And they let me start the business. And so... With the wind in my sails, I carried on. And the next, you know, if anyone's going to start a business in here, you're going to have to speak to a lot of important people, whether they're clients or employees or whatever else. And as a 19-year-old kid that's never done it before, that's an incredibly daunting task. How do you go about that? How do you get their attention? I hired a guy called Ashley, and I said, Ash, I need to get 10,000 pounds worth of camera equipment for the business for when we launch. I said, that's your job, Ash. Good luck first task I gave him. So off Ashley went, and he did what probably everybody in this room would do, sent hundreds of emails out, hundreds of emails. Please, can we have free cameras? Shock, we got no free cameras. <laughs> I fired Ashley. No, I didn't. I'm joking. No, I didn't fire Ashley. 
But I, but I looked at, I reflected on that situation, and it's synonymous with how I think we all incorrectly approach challenge or obstacles in our life. We tend to default to convention and the blueprint that convention has presented us with because it's the safest, apparently tried and tested approach. And you know, if I said to everybody in this room right now, I'm gonna give you an ax and there's a tree here, you see this whole image here, and I'm gonna give you one hour, if you cut down that tree, you get a million US dollars. What most people will do is they pick up the ax and they just start swinging it at the tree, right? Hammering away for an hour, just hard work, boom, 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 boom. The hour ends and this has happened. You've made a small dent in the tree, you've not won the million dollars, and you've lost. And what you really should have done, and what I've come to learn over the, the couple of years, and what I've learned from some of my great, great mentors like Elon Musk, is the answer in this case was right there in front of you, but convention has made you default to the most popular decision, not the truth. What you would have noticed is the ax was blunt, and there was a rock there, you could have sharpened it. That, that was the truth at hand. But convention just says, swing ax at tree, that's what everybody does. Send tons of emails, that's what everybody does. And the thing is, when you follow convention, you get conventional results, right? but we all do it. Almost at every instance when we're, we, where we're faced with a, with a challenge or a task, or we're starting our business, or we're thinking about branding or marketing, we look to what everyone else is doing. You know, we look at the, the model of how it's been being done, and we replicate that, and then we're surprised when we get the same results as everyone else. Fundamentally, if you want to innovate, and if you want new results, you have to bring new solutions to the table. This is what Elon Musk defines as the reason why he's been successful. PayPal, Tesla, SpaceX. He says he reasons from first principles, which means whenever there's a challenge in his life, he ignores convention, and he just focuses on what he knows to be true. If you do that in this case, what do we know to be true about very important people? They get lots of emails, lots of people asking them for stuff. Lots of people offering very little in return. They have personal assistants that intercept those emails from people like Ashley, read them, and then delete them. We all know that, right? But we all still just send the email, right? That's what Ashley did. And that's what reasoning from first principles is. It's stopping, which is, and this sounds so simple, it's impossibly hard, stopping and thinking, literally writing down what you know to be true, and when you have those truths there, like the four I've just told you, you come up with completely different answers that convention would never have told you for your challenge and for today. And with those four things in mind, what would you do? You definitely wouldn't send an email. You definitely wouldn't just be begging for things. You'd definitely try and stand out. You'd definitely try and bypass the PA. So we started sending gold envelopes, big, shiny, metallic gold envelopes. And when you get a gold envelope in the post, you think you've won something. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened. We sent 10 gold envelopes and two companies, Panasonic and a company called Vivo, both said they'd give us the camera equipment. This is the marketing director at Panasonic saying, I've sent you the cameras. If you ever don't need them, just send them back. 10,000 pounds worth of free camera equipment because we sent him this gold envelope where we didn't just beg, we also offered tons, as much as we possibly could in return. We said every video we make, we'll put Panasonic in the corner. And again, we, we just reasoned from the things we need to be true. And this is the story, in essence, of, of my journey. It's that, that process of really thinking first, not about convention, but about what I know to be true. The same really applies for when I was 16. I was kicked out of school at 16 years old because I believed that I wouldn't need school to start a business. Then I went to university at 18 years old, and in that first week, in that one lecture, I thought, if I want to be an entrepreneur, who am I going to show this piece of paper to? I thought, I don't need a degree to be an entrepreneur. I can just start being one. And that was my truth. And it's crazy that three years later, the, the, the young men and women that did the exact business degree that I dropped out of, on my mother's life, I remember it like, yesterday, stop me and say, Steve, how do, so how do we start a business? <laughs> I promise you, I promise you, 
They have no idea. How, how did you, the question I got from one girl called Hannah Turley, when I stood in my, in my car outside this shop, she said, Steve, she just graduated for four years of the, the degree I dropped out of. So how did you go about starting that business? And for me, that said a lot about the world and the age we live in, where you have the, the, the net, the sum total of all known human history and information in the palm of all of your hands. The opportunities are ridiculous. It's a privilege that we've never, ever had in the history of the world. You can find anything out, you can learn any skill if you have the internet and a mobile phone. You got lucky. I get this a lot. I get this a lot. Moments like that where Panasonic sent, you know, you got lucky. But this, the same thing happened when I was 16 years old. Our school were debating which big vending machines to fit our school out with, flicking through this catalog in the common room. They had assigned the, the task of buying vending machines to the sixth form. I said, why do we need to pay a company for vending machines when we have 1,500 kids in our school? 1,500 paying customers, they should be paying us to put their vending machines in our school. Everybody disagreed with me. I went to the computer room, I contacted the first five vending machine companies on Google that came up in our area in Plymouth, and with, on, my, on my mother's life, by, that was at break time. By lunchtime, which is two hours later, I was pulled out of my, of my class. A guy had come from a vending machine company, just so happens, and this happens a lot when you try, just so happens, the CEO of the company went to our school when he was younger and was looking to give back anyway. They came to our school, fit our whole, and I've been back to speak at the school twice, and I tell this story every time. The whole school, still to this day, and it's been, what, almost 10 years, um, is still fit with those vending machines for free, and the deal I negotiated means we get 20% of all the revenue and the profits from the machines. Again, that's just thinking from first principles. Why would we accept convention? And it's, a cr it's crazy what can happen to your life when you start thinking like that. You got lucky. People still say it, though. And I understand that to some degree. This is another example which a lot of people consider luck. When I was in 2011, when I sent my first email out looking for an investor for this website I was building, within two days, I literally just went on LinkedIn, LinkedIn, like she was promoting it earlier on. They must be a sponsor. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> um, within two days, the 2nd of September, the 4th of September, he says, if you get the team together, blah, 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 I'll give you the money you need to start the website. I went on LinkedIn, typed in investor. The first guy that came up, Alistair Milne, said he'd give me 5,000 pounds to me was you know, more money than I'd ever seen in my entire life combined. It was a tremendous amount of money to me. He said he'd give me the money if I um, built the team and put the team together. What you don't see is that first email was sent at 4 a.m. So it looks like luck, but I was up all night working on how to get investors and putting in tremendous work, which most people won't. But it still kind of looks like luck. And when I think about luck and why we, we tend to like to sweep things under the carpet and call them luck, I've got to think about my own experiences. And I've got to be honest with myself. I used to hate Justin Bieber. <laughs> Clearly some of you still do. <laughs> and I think I used to hate Justin Bieber because he's young and he's sexy and he was like almost my age. We always tend to hate people who we can almost relate to as well because, you know, when someone's close to you, whether it's a family member or whatever, or when you can, you can almost see yourself as them, it really shines the spotlight back on you as to why you're not achieving the same level of success. And that's often why the people closest to you, your best friends often can hate on you even more than total strangers, right? But I hate on Justin Bieber. Rich, look at him with his diamond cross there, performing to 500,000 people here. You know, just it irritated me. I was jealous, lucky. And then one day, I saw this. That's a seven-year-old Justin Bieber on the streets of Toronto, alone, busking for one-dollar bills, singing his heart out to total passers-by and strangers. And I know what I was doing when I was seven years old, absolutely nothing, playing with mud, right? And that's the thing with luck. 
Hard and smart work increases your chance of finding opportunity. And when you find that opportunity, when Usher comes across Justin Bieber online because he's spent the last six and a half years singing out on the street and uploading videos of himself, the results look a lot like luck. 813 days into my journey, Wallpark, my website, was finally ready to launch. Blood, sweat, tears, you name it. My mum still wasn't talking to me, right? And I went to everybody I'd met in the last 813 days, and I said to them, Wallpark, the website that you said you'd sign up to, is now live. I emailed my friends, my family, every meeting I'd had, everybody. Wallpark is now live. And nobody came. That's the end of my story. No, I'm joking. Okay. It could have been. Nobody came. And then in that particular moment, as I reflected on that, I learned a very important lesson, which a lot of people might make people feel quite uncomfortable, which is that life doesn't owe me anything. And I think somewhere in me, I thought that just because I'd worked really hard for 813 days and I'd sacrificed so much, I was guaranteed success. I thought somewhere in me that life owed me something, and it's just not the case. In fact, the idea that life does owe you something is one of the biggest limiting beliefs we have. It gets in the way of work. It gets in the way of truth. It obstructs humility. And so what I did is I started researching why and how you do marketing. I went online. It said put posters up around the university campuses. I did that. I got half of my 5,000 pound marketing budget that this guy had given me, spent it on posters, put them up everywhere around the campus, and nobody came. 2,500 pounds left. Maybe posters are too big, I'll try flyers. I print off a handful of flyers. Early morning, we went around all of the campuses in the university areas, handing out these flyers. On the flyer, it literally said you could win 100 pounds if you signed up to my website and nobody came. No money, no money left. I went to the university and I pleaded with them, please will you put an advert in the student university paper about my website? They very, very kindly obliged, and they put me inside the university student newspaper, which went around to all of the student halls of residence. This new website on campus is finally here, and nobody came. And some amazing things happen when you run out of money. You get very creative. It's true. If you, if you run a business and you want your team to be more creative with their marketing, if you want them to have to reason from those first principles, take away the budget. Because what budgets are there for is to be spent, and people spend them on things that they know, like flyers and posters. And really, what I was doing in that moment is I was just swinging the axe again. The internet told me that if you want people to come to your website, hand out flyers. So I spent my money on flyers. Unsurprisingly, I got zilch, no results. That blueprint had been exhausted. Same with the posters, same with the job ads. And so what I did is I reflected a little bit, and I started to write down a couple of things that I knew to be true. One of those things was people didn't even want to take my flyers because they were so busy looking at their mobile phones. So I went to Domino's Pizza in September. I got a big wad of these leaflets that they give out for free, which give you a free pizza for one. I went to the university campus, handed them out for a screenshot of the settings section in your phone. And that tells me where you spend your time. It's really obvious today. But in 2010 and 11, this wasn't obvious. The answer was social media. So in my very rational, logical thinking brain, I just needed to own as much space on this thing that was distracting students as I possibly could. I went on Twitter. I typed in the word student. The first page that came up was called Student Problems, started by this kid called Dominic McGregor. It had 5,000 students following it. I sent him a message. I said, Dom, meet me at a bar between his university and between where I was staying, about 150 miles for us both to travel. I sat him down in this bar, and I said, Dom, I need you to drop out of university. <laughs> and I need you to give me that social media page you started and move the 300 miles from Edinburgh in Scotland where he lived to Manchester. And I said, we're going to build this website. And much to Dominic's mother's anger and dismay, <laughs> Dominic was very persuadable. And he dropped out of university. 
And at 20 years old, he moved to Manchester with me, and we spent all summer building all of these massive Facebook pages and Instagram pages and Twitter pages. And by the end of summer, we had four million students on these Facebook and Instagram and Twitter pages. And we could literally drive 33,000 students a day, roughly, just by posting about my website onto my website. That's over a million students a month that were coming to my website and using my website just from these Facebook and social media pages. And we were not making any money at this point, so we thought, okay, again, convention. What does convention say? Convention says if you've got a million people coming to your website, put brands on your website. That's the conventional model. You can, you can see it there. Put brands on the website. And then I did my small little exercise of reasoning from first principles, and this didn't make a whole lot of sense because all of the traffic was coming from social media. I had four million students on social media pages. In fact, the website was just getting in the way. When you think about it, you can just put the brands directly on the social media pages. Again, a concept we all understand now, but in 2010, this was revolutionary. And I approached my investors, I said, listen, I've got an idea. I had five investors at this point, some of the biggest in the world, right? I've got this idea. Social media, I think, is going to become like the website. We can put brands there. This was at a time when brands weren't on social media. My investors said, Steve, shut up and get back to work. <laughs> they didn't believe it. They didn't believe in me. They didn't believe that idea. So I quit. Something I'm very good at. I quit a lot of things in my life. I think there's this... This misconception that quitting is for losers. I think knowing when to quit is really a trait of the successful, right? Staying at something that's toxic and that's sucking the life out of you and that you don't believe in, that's what unsuccessful people do. Successful people know when to quit, and they do it fearlessly. Big glass of wine in London one day, sent the email, I quit. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's my mum. <laughs> I quit. And at 21 years old, with no real plan, I went around all of the world for the first time. This was the first time I got on a plane. I went around all of the world, and I met every young person that I could find that had built a big social media page on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, you name it. I met them all. I told them all to drop out and join me and give me their social media pages, and they did. <laughs> Crazy, isn't it? <clears throat> they all still work for me now, you know, and they're all doing great. <laughs> That's what I did, 21 years old, persuaded all these young kids to drop out of university and give me their social media pages. And in exchange, I gave them a job, because this is really what their interests were. Their parents were telling them, go and get a real job. Connor had 17 million followers, right? He was making no money from it. Connor in the bottom left corner there ran the world's biggest food page on Instagram, the world's biggest fitness page on Facebook and on Twitter. To me, that was the job. That was the real job his mother was pressuring him to go and get, right? His mum couldn't see that, though. So I said to Connor, I know you owe your mum 50 quid and you haven't got a place to stay. I'll give you really good money, better than a doctor gets paid, a year, right? You come and join me and you can do that thing that you do for fun. Because I see value in that for brands and... And that's the story across the board. And I can tell you every single university they went to. I can tell you the, the day almost when they dropped out. Hannah was off to be a teacher in the bottom left corner. Nick Speakman in the top left, he was, he, you know, he was, he had, was running this sports Twitter account which had about 500,000 followers. And if you go through, we acquired all of the biggest social media pages across various categories from the biggest Snapchat pages in the world, cupcake pages, two million people following a cupcake page on Instagram, Pomsky dogs, right? We had 400 social media pages. Nick, whose page was you know, 500,000 followers on Twitter, He'd started this brand called Sporf. It now has 16 million followers, a team of about 20 people that run it. We're, the team are currently in Vegas filming the Conor McGregor fight tonight. It's more engaged and, more, and bigger than ESPN Sport, right? Student Problems, the page Dom started. He had 5,000 followers when I met him. It's the biggest student community on planet Earth. Has 11 million followers, 9 million followers on Facebook alone. It does 500 million video views a month. Love Travel's the same. Be Fit Motivation that Connor started, it's the biggest fitness community in the world now, the biggest on social media. Love Food, it's the third biggest behind BuzzFeed's Tasty. That's annoying to say. Game Bite, the biggest in the world, the biggest gaming channel you will find on social media with about seven million gamers following it. And Football, we bought all of the biggest fan channels on YouTube. So we own the Manchester United fan channel, big United fan here. We own the biggest Spurs, thank you. Um, eight of the biggest football 
fan channels on YouTube we owned. In, in total, we owned about 400 of these massive social media pages, and that meant that we were doing between 1.8 and 6.2 billion video views a month online. And when you think about that in terms of other traditional companies that you know, that puts us ahead of the Walt Disney Company and Time Warner. We were this mammoth media company that could make, as the papers have reported it, anything interesting, anything trend online. And then from that, we knew we had something else. We had all of this reach, all of these big social media pages, but we also had all the talent, all of the young kids that had built these channels. And that in and of itself is a business. So we made it one. And that's called Social Chains Agency. And we do the marketing now for the biggest brands in the world. Our clients are Amazon, Uber, Twitch, FIFA. We did the World Cup, Coca-Cola. We do their marketing across Europe. I, live, I now live in New York City, and we've signed some of the world's biggest brands in New York as well. And so here are uh, an image of some of those brands. The next thing we did, which is one step further, is when you have a massive audience and you have the marketing capabilities to reach them, you don't just have to sell other people's products, you can sell your own. So we started making our own products and selling them on social media to our own audience. And that part of our business will generate about $90 million this year alone. One more step. <laughs> I'm just getting started. Um, one more step. When you have a big audience, you know how to reach them. You can create real world events as well. So two years ago, we started the world's, what is now Europe's biggest beauty convention. Sells out in about three to six minutes. 25, 30,000 young girls attend this event six times a year. And the world's biggest fitness event, which takes place in Germany at the Allianz Arena. And to re I've said a lot, so I wanted to just recap all of that in a small one-minute video, which hopefully um, kind of gives it a little bit of clarity. And as it, um, as it said in that video, Social Chain became a public company, which means we're now in the stock market. The net valuation of the company fluctuates between 180 million and 200 million, depending on the day, um, which can be quite nerve-wracking, in fact. Um, and when you think about this, you think this kid's 27 years old. A couple of years ago, he was broke, comes from a bankrupt family and all these things. You'd probably say that it's pretty weird, right? Probably say it's pretty weird. Probably quite an accurate description of that situation. From, to go from that position to this position with a company that's five years old is pretty weird. And my roommates were right. But when you say pretty weird sounding things and then you do pretty weird feeling actions, you get tremendously weird looking results. And if you spend your life doing very normal looking things, saying normal looking things and doing normal looking things every time you wake up, you'll probably get pretty normal looking results. 
I think if you tell me, if you tell me what you're doing every day, if you tell me what you're saying every day, if you show me who you're hanging around with, I can probably quite accurately predict what your future looks like in the three, five, ten year time frame. And again, it's those, those people that have the cojones, that have the self-belief, that has what it takes to stand outside of the herd and live a maybe a slightly weird looking life for a small amount of time that will end up with the most weird results. So social media. Before I got off stage, I did want to talk to you about social media because that is my industry after all. And I think, it's, I think there's a lot we can learn from social media that we can implement into all of our lives, irrespective of who we are. The first thing is where we are in the climate of social media. There have been tremendous scandals in the last couple of years. Apparently, your stolen data, according to Americans, got Donald Trump elected. Facebook have been on the receiving end of all of this, and Mark Zuckerberg, the, the CEO and founder, has been repeatedly shut down and, and bullied by the press who blame him for the state of social media. It's bad for our mental health. You've heard it all. And when you look at the, the data, the term fake news became popular in January 2017 a 17,000% increase in this term fake news. But it doesn't just impact news. When we look at the data on Crimson Hexagon, it impacts everything that we believe to be true. It impacts truth. It's impacted how much we believe each other. It's impacted how, we, how much we see um, things to be true for what they are. And I wanted to show you, uh, make two kind of separate points. The first is why fake news and why fake things travel, especially when they polarize people, and secondly, how you can use this to change your own lives. So the first thing is how fake news travels and why this matters. If you're looking to market yourself in 2020, if you're looking to market your brand, this is a, a very important thing to know. When cultural sentiment meets a polarizing emotion, it travels at speed. And that applies to all disciplines of life, art, politics, culture, whatever it might be. To show this, I did a little experiment. I was speaking at the world's biggest football conference called Soccer X. And I looked at the, the general trends across football, and the most polarized conversation in football culture was that Arsenal Football Club hadn't signed a football player. So what I did is I made up a fake football player called Rex Seco, which is an anagram of the word Soccer X. I went on Google Images, I found the first photo I could. I called this guy here Rex Seco. I made some graphics to make it feel real. Again, if you, if you want a message to travel, you've got to know how to pull on emotions. So I made him 34 million pounds, very, very expensive, 16 years old, very inexperienced, and really, really bad at football, according to the stats. And then I pressed our magic social chain button, and we told the world that this young, very bad player, very expensive player, had signed for Arsenal. And within minutes, the world is talking. Within the first couple of minutes, two minutes, people are saying, who is this Rex Echo? I've never heard of him in my life. Ten minutes in, people are saying, this Rex Echo looks worth the money. <laughs> Arsenal have signed the next big thing in British football. Better than Benzema. Fifteen minutes in, it starts trending on all the major social media platforms because there's 26,000 people talking about the signing of this player, Rex Echo. Twenty minutes in, more tweets coming in from all around the world. Twenty-four minutes in, this guy on the bottom says, man, no one has a clue about that Rex Echo. <laughs> but that wasn't necessarily true because this guy could have sworn he'd seen him play before. <laughs> We all have a friend like that, right? <laughs> it starts trending at number two on social media. People start discussing it over on Reddit. The, the papers write about the story ferociously because they get their money if they write fake things while they're still relevant. The Mirror afterwards called it one of football's greatest ever hoaxes. It did 300,000 search results on Google if you Google Rex Echo right now. 900 million impressions just in that one night. Global impact all around the world according to our heat map. And the shirt still hangs in my office. <laughs> uh, so, 34 million pound Rex Echo. And the reason I say this is because it's really important to understand how the ability to make things that aren't true spread has impacted all of our lives in ways that we probably don't appreciate. The conversation around authenticity from January 2017 exploded. 
the conversation around what is true in terms of what we're reading, in terms of people, in terms of what we're hearing, exploded from the point in January 2017. The conversation around lies exploded in January 2017 as well. We started to question what is true more than ever before. And how do you, as a business owner, as a CEO, as an employee, whatever it might be, how do you build trust? How do you lead? How do you earn customers if nobody believes what you're saying? Right? If, there, if skepticism is at an all-time high, trust is this thing that holds relationships together. When you ask your customers for money, they're trusting that you're going to give them something in return. So how do you operate in such an environment where trust is at an all-time low? The global trust report by Endelman shows that trust has continued to erode. Less than a quarter of us now believe what we see on social media. And what this has meant is that with all change, with everything that feels like a threat, there's an opportunity created. So at a time when people are believing less and less than ever before, there's another door which is just opened, which you can walk through if you're brave enough to. And this is a great example from a company called Everlane, who, who decided that in a world where we don't trust anything, they're going to be radically transparent. And they're going to try and... So the CEO here has written a letter on their Instagram saying, nobody tells you this, this is what he said, nobody tells you this, but the price that we pay our suppliers for Kashmir fluctuates all year. And our industry never changed the price for you as the customer. That's the wrong thing to do. So now, whenever the price changes that we pay our suppliers, we're going to change it for you. And we think the industry should do the same. This is an approach that most brands would never have taken a couple of years ago. But when you compare their sentiment, their growth, to all of their key competitors and their brand love score, it doesn't compare to anybody else. They're radically transparent, right? And this is what we call a glass box world. In the marketing world now, especially in the Western world, we're now talking about brands and personal brands, every single one of you, as now having to be glass boxes if you want to build trust with your audience or your customers. Once upon a time, we could be a black box. And in a black box world, a brand like that brand there, they would paint the perception of who they are on the outside of the box. And the CEO would tell you in a press release or in marketing, we're a great company. But in a world where we don't believe the person holding the paintbrush, that's no longer a winning strategy, right? And the media will write negative stories about the only way to survive is to let the sides down and let the world see in. Also, in a world where all of you have social media and within a second, you can report something to the world that you have seen, there's no such thing as internal private company culture anymore. Company culture is now public company culture, which is your brand, right? And this has caused a really radical shift. And Elon Musk, I think, is another interesting example. He went on YouTube and smoked a joint, right? Did a two-hour conversation where he cried his eyes out. And people saw that. He's the CEO of three billion dollar companies. They said, Elon Musk is crazy. He's lost his damn mind. That's not how a CEO is meant to act. Here he is on Twitter, joking with a fake Mars Twitter account that he wants to... They told me this was a family event, so I'm probably not going to say this. Nut, because the parody Mars Twitter account tweeted him a photo of Mars. So he wants to nut. If anybody doesn't know what that means, I probably shouldn't ejaculate. <laughs> um, they're never going to invite me back. Um, but when you compare Elon Musk's public sentiment to Mark Zuckerberg, the CEO of Facebook, who has never, up until that point, done public press, he was in his shell, in his bunker, it doesn't compare. He's 10 times more liked by the public. And what this means as a brand and as an individual is if the media write a horrible story about Elon Musk, I have a personal reference point to debunk that story. I read the story, I think, well, no, I, I know Elon Musk. I feel like I could tweet at him. I watched him cry for two hours. If the media write a fake a story about Mark Zuckerberg saying that he is evil and that he's Facebook are controlling your data, and I have no reference point. So I naturally believe the story written about Mark Zuckerberg. And this is in part why Mark Zuckerberg, as one of the most secretive CEOs, has the worst public reputation of all the major CEOs. He realized this. And he made a pledge this year to come out of his bunker and start doing press. So really the key, 
of my presentation is that people need to joke about ejaculation and smoke weed on YouTube if they want to be trusted. <laughs> no, I'm joking. That's not, that's not the key. That's, I'm joking. But so Elon, so Zuckerberg said this year he's going to come out and he's done a podcast. He's got a YouTube series now. He's filming live the board meetings at Facebook only this year for the first time ever. Because he knows the world we live in where we don't trust anything and the way things have changed, press releases aren't the way that you're going to succeed as a business. And this is what I did as well. I launched a podcast called The Diary of a CEO. It's the number one business podcast in the UK. And it's my very open and honest personal diary. I'm, I know some of you in here have read it because I recognize your faces. Yeah, <laughs> appreciate you. Um, like and subscribe. Um, <laughs> um, but it's exactly that. It's the things you would never hear a CEO of a public company with 700 employees say. I talk about my girlfriend. I talk about my mum. I talk about things I'm struggling with, things that I'm unable to solve, situations I handled really, really badly. And that honesty and that rawness in a world where Instagram and social media is full of perfection, that is occupying the void, right? That's the, occupying the void that nobody is brave enough to occupy. But that void represents the 99% of all of your lives because all of your lives aren't eating nice food in fancy restaurants and being on holiday, that's the 0.1%. When you look on social media, that's what you get. But it doesn't represent the 99% of your life. The 99% of your life is hard. It's struggle. It's real. It's eating noodles in bed or rice. Rice and peas. And salt fish and ackee. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Did my research. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody know where this is? Times Square, New York, correct. I put my Instagram feed in the middle of it and you didn't even see it, right? Probably nobody saw that. The fact that I can put my Instagram feed in the middle of Times Square and none of you can see it should tell you everything you need to know about the current state of social media. How do you feel when you're in Times Square? Anxious, I live in New York, anxious. Flashing things, everybody trying to sell to you, overwhelming. How do you, as a brand or as an individual, get your message heard in Times Square? You can't. And this is super important context, again, as it relates to how you, as an individual, will get heard in this world. Nobody likes it when I say this, and I understand why. <laughs> but if you look at key individuals like Kanye West, like Donald Trump, this is Jordan Peterson, an author, and Katie Hopkins, a social commentator, what they've done in a world where we've, we, we tend to conform because we are tribal creatures. We grew up in tribes, and if you left your tribe when you were in the savannas of Africa, that would almost definitely result in you dying. We, we were conditioned to conform, and there's social currency available for those that do. Likes, followers, retweets. These guys are operate, operating in the void. Whether you like them or not, Irrespective of how many stones you throw at them to get them to fall back in line, they have made the decision that they are going to operate in that void created by perfectionism, falsehoods, and conformity. And in every single instance, in their, in their own respective ways, they are winning. Kanye West is killing the game within music and clothing now. Three billion dollars his company was just valued at. And, he, and the value of his company went like this when he started really being himself and really not conforming. Jordan Peterson, one of the most controversial authors in the world, is maybe right now the most popular author in the world, the most talked about without a shadow of a doubt. Katie Hopkins, people don't like her either. She's one of the most, the biggest social commentators in the world, and Donald Trump is president, and he's an asshole. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> right? And the conversation just revolves around these characters that are brave enough to be their truest self. They also win financially. And there's a lesson to learn there about having the braveness to fill the void. And even though in some cases that might result in less than savory things, there's an important lesson throughout marketing there. And it comes back to these, these, these central ideas of when you understand a cultural sentiment, whether it's in politics or music like Kanye does, and you have the, the, the audacity to be your truest self, that creates emotion, which means that your message spreads. And one of our big famous predictions as a company was we predicted publicly that Donald Trump was going to be elected. I'm really, yeah. On my mother's life, we did. And we said this to Coca-Cola. This is the reason why we signed Coca-Cola as a client, because we went there about six weeks before the election and displayed to them that using our data, we think Donald Trump's going to be elected. There's this huge difference in, in po po uh, phone polling 
where people, when you call them with a person and say, who are you going to vote for, they all say Hillary. But when it's a machine that calls them, it sways about 10%, right? And then you look at the enthusiasm on social media. Enthusiasm is what gets people out of bed on voting day. And you comp compound all of these factors, you think there's a good chance that it's going to be pretty close. And with the Electoral College, you can figure out which states are going to vote. It's not how many votes you get, it's where you get your votes. And so that's why we made that very, very public prediction. And then there's certain brands that are winning because of this. Brands that are filling the void, like Nike. Nike are the most relevant they've ever been. Their stock is the highest it's ever been because they are brave enough to attach themselves to cultural relevance while it's still relevant. The guy breaks the record for the, the two-hour marathon. They didn't have him signed. Within 24 hours the first time, they signed him and had him on billboards in New York. Colin Kaepernick, Serena Williams, every cultural moment, they stick their brand in there even though they know it's going to be polarizing, even though they know it's easier to conform, and they've won continuously because of it. In the marketing world, they are the poster child of how to do marketing great. But it requires that same bravery that it, that it took me to drop out of university. It requires that decision or that removal of a decision and a little bit of faith. And lastly, the last point I wanted to leave you with is about influencer marketing. A lot of people talk about influencer marketing here in Jamaica as one of the central points of marketing. And I wanted to kind of show you how everything I've said has resulted in influencer marketing being a very dying discipline. And Emma is the problem. You might not know who Emma is, but I do. This is Emma. I started following Emma, oh, you know an Emma. I started following Emma in January 2019 on social media, and Emma said to me, she did this post on Instagram, and she said, this is my favorite hotel. Thank you for the recommendation, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Log off Instagram, come back two weeks later. Emma's posted, she said, this is my favorite hotel. Everybody changes their mind, ladies and gentlemen. You've got to give everybody the benefit of a doubt until the third time Emma posted. And she said, this is my favorite hotel. And then two weeks after that, she said, this is my favorite. And then two weeks after that, this Shangri-La hotel was her favorite hotel. And then two weeks after that, the Cotswold hotel was her favorite hotel. And then two weeks after that, this hotel is her favorite hotel. Does anybody believe that any of those hotels are Emma's favorite hotel? But there's a marketing director out there that's going to swing the ax again and pay Emma another thousand dollars to say her hotel is her favorite. Well, you don't believe it. The industry is just swinging the ax. We know people don't believe it. We don't believe it. But we don't pause to think from first principles. We don't pause to think about that truth. It's easier as a marketing director with a budget just to give Emma another thousand dollars and say, please, Emma, just go pose on a bed and say that another hotel is our favorite hotel. For marketing to work, for you to work as a personal brand, you need these two factors which are more important than ever before, which is you need to be believed and you need to be felt. That's why truth and emotion are the most important things that have left influencer marketing. And if you look at how influencer marketing is playing out, the CEO of one of the biggest fashion brands in the world, who's one of my best friends, who I was just with when I, before I flew out here, said to me one day, we, we have 700 influencers signed to our books every single month. We pay 700 influencers, and I genuinely believe now that if I turned off all 700 girls from posting, it would have no impact on the bottom line of our business. This is a business that was created by influencer marketing. They're worth four billion as of last week, and he thinks it has no impact now whatsoever. And when I look at all of their marketing efforts, it's basically a bunch of emotionless billboards. You send someone a dress, and they pose, I know, you know, like, that's basically what... <laughs> You don't believe it. You know they're being paid. But somewhere, someone's expecting consumers to believe it. They post your dress, then your, next, your nearest competitor's best dress, and then the other brand's dress. And so what we did is we looked at, from first principles, what it is that made influencer marketing work. According to psychology, it's getting an endorsement from someone who's an authority figure that has reach. But in a world where we don't believe a word you're saying, your endorsement doesn't matter. And if we don't believe what you're saying, you're not an authority figure on something. So what influencer marketing had become was just reach, without the thing that made it powerful, without the truth and without the emotion, without the authority that that dress or that thing is worth buying. And so what we did is we injected a bit of truth and emotion back into their marketing efforts. We first trialed this with another brand, and I'm going to show you the top line results. First thing we did was banned all photos. You're not allowed to use photos anymore because they are low emotion. You have to make videos if you want to work with this brand. The next thing we did is we made the videos themselves highly emotional. So this one is called the outfit I'm going to dump my boyfriend in. 
The next thing we did is we let influencers tell the truth. If you don't like the item, say in the video, you don't like the item. If you think that this is not the shade of purple that you saw on the website, tell your followers that. Tell them the truth. And just with a little bit of truth and emotion, 240% increase in reach from the same, it was 213 girls. Traffic to the website increased by almost 200%, and sales, most importantly, increased by 64%. The same influencers with the same budget, just a different strategy that was filled with truth and emotion. And that, I guess, is my conclusive point. The reason why I think I was successful was because from a very early age, I had the confidence to pursue my truth. Even in the face of a lot of criticism, pressure, and sacrifice, the reason why I think I'm happy is because I've lived my truest life. And truth is this thing that has spurred me on and helped me make all my decisions. And the reason why I know my future will be perfectly okay is because I'm gonna to continue to live my truest life. According to all of the psychology, those that live their truest, truest lives experience the most happiness and the least despair. They experience the least depression. It's the communities within society that are most oppressed and forced not to be them, their truest selves, like the LGBT community, that face the highest suicide rates and the, are typically the least successful in their private endeavors. We work with the biggest brands in the world. They say some nice things about us. The press say some nice things about us. As I said, the company's doing tremendously well. What I didn't show you is that photo I showed you at the start from my diary was actually taken in my Range Rover when I was 25 years old. All of that is really nice, but the thing that means the most to me is that me and my mum have never had a better relationship. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, love. Thank you, love. Thank you. Come on, thank you, thank you. Round of applause. In English, that was a very weak round of applause. Thank you. Stephen, thank you. Have to thank you. Translate. Um, thank you so much, Stephen. Um, so a couple of myths that we, we broke having met Stephen in person. So the first thing is, if you watch his videos, I thought he was much shorter. Every uh, one of us thought he was much shorter. So I'm like 5'3", <laughs> and he says he's 6'2", so that's the first myth broken. Uh -huh. And then when we met you for the first time last night, we're like, and he actually looks much better in person uh. than <laughs> he does in his pictures and on his videos. Oh, his videos, you know. So yeah, we're breaking some myths. But Stephen, you're in a room of about five or 600 family members. Consider us family. Tell us the truth. You're not 27. No, I am. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. I don't feel 27, but, you know, that, that old expression that age is nothing but a number is so true, you know, because I, it, it, it doesn't, it honestly doesn't matter. Um, and again, it's, it feels like age is just this limiting thing that you can or can't buy into, and I've just never really bought into it. So, yeah. No, and that goes that's... both ways. It goes, you know, I think that typically people get to a certain age where they think they're too old or you know, they've, they've missed their chance. I think that is, again, a self-imposed um, limitation that's just unhelpful, so, yeah. Wow, just awesome, awesome nuggets, awesome wisdom. Thank you for sharing Thank you so much. Products. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks again. Please, round of applause for Stephen. Thanks. So, so Stephen, of course, has shared, a, we now have a generous block of time to ask Stephen some questions. He's gonna be here with us, remember, Keep sharing, tweeting, posting any nuggets you've got. Tag us at JMMB Group, hashtag JMMB Elevate. I see a hand right here, lady in the white sweater, I think, on jacket, trying to see. Uh -oh. So, my question, you spoke a lot about your creative journey, about your personal drive, and how, you know, perseverance, so you were kind of crazy. <laughs>
Thank you. Yeah, so I get asked um, a, a lot how, how I've done what I've done. And um, the most like simple, truest answer that I could give you, and it's super simple, is I just never believed that I couldn't, right? And as I said in the, the, the talk earlier on, honestly, the biggest barrier between you going from where you are to where you want to be is you believing that you can't. My favorite quote in the world is those who think they can and those who think they can't are both usually right. And it's for that very reason. I knew nothing about social media. I knew nothing about running a business. I'm not born knowing, right? I didn't go to, I left school when I was 60 and I got kicked out. University lasted a week for me. So I didn't have, um, my parents, you know, they've never done anything like this at all. Social media probably didn't exist when they were born. The thing that gave me, and set me to acquire the information that you've asked how I acquired was honestly the belief that I could be that person. And that leads you to try, right? And this is the crazy thing about self-belief is you'll get motivational speakers that will come up on stage or on Instagram and they'll tell you to believe in yourself. They'll just say like, believe in yourself it's as if it, it's that easy, right? Like you've gone 25 years of your life, you've had this tremendous experience, your, your childhood trauma, your parents, the situation you grew up in, the country you grew up in. Someone in London telling you to believe in, believe in yourself is not like really useful advice. So I, I stray away from that and I look at how belief works. And here's the truth, right? If I got your dearest relative and I held a gun to their head, uh, hear, hear me out. <laughs> Strange way to start a point, isn't it? And I said to you that I'm going to pull the trigger unless you start believing that I am a spaghetti monster. No matter how much you wanted to save your relative's life, you couldn't believe that. You could only lie to try and save their life. You couldn't believe I was the spaghetti monster because you have no evidence for that, right? And that's how belief works. So if I just stand in front of you and say, believe in yourself, the 25 years of your, your life's experience, the 30 years of your life's experience, that everything you've been through is a much stronger force to suggest otherwise. So how do you get past that? And it goes back to that spider that you saw run out of its, of its circle. You, you don't, don't worry about taking on a mountain or you know, becoming a millionaire overnight. Just focus one small step outside of your comfort zone, whatever that step might be. It might be getting a gym membership. It might be making the Instagram page for that business that you've told yourself you're gonna start for the last five years. One small step a day compounds over time. And you look back and think, wow, I just did a bunch of stuff that I never believed that I could. And that's how you, you create belief in yourself. You have to build evidence. Motivational quotes on Instagram won't do that. You have to go do that. You have to go prove to yourself, you know, or, or I have to prove to you. I have to show you a spaghetti arm, one of them, for you to start believing that. And I think, I think again, that, that relates back to the point of self-belief being the most important thing. You got this one guy who made like a huge impact yeah. and sold a lot of record and gave him the money to do the thing that he's doing. How do you find those people? Okay, so the question basically yeah. was how, if you how relate you back to, to my story, um, he's saying, how, how do you be get the people? And your first point was, um, how do you do what I did on social media now? How do you like seize that opportunity now, right? And here's the thing. This is, this is like part of the problem with, with the question is there's always an a new opportunity, always, at all times. In fact, social media is being disrupted. It's actually on its, in many respects, on its way down. You can't actually do what I did. But at all times, there's a new opportunity. And it's the people that go after the new thing, not the thing they saw Steve Bartlett come in Jamaica to talk about. They're the next Steve Bartlett that speaks on stage at Jamaica, right? And you ask me as well how you do that. It's the same, you know, you might ask me what, what, what's our company going to do um, to make sure that we survive the next evolution. It's the same things. It's like following truth, not convention. And, and so you shouldn't be sat in your seats thinking, okay, I'm going to go home and start telling kids to drop out of university and I'm going <laughs> to make 100 million. That's not, that's not the path to take. That's been done, right? You can't, you know, once upon a time, uh, somebody made billions from from horses and carriages. We're now making billions from electric cars and spaceships, right? So you've got to think about what's coming next. And really, more than anything, it is, there is opportunities right now the same size and bigger than the one that I took advantage of in 2010. Obviously, it's not obvious. Else I wouldn't be here now. I'd be back in 
London with my team, you know, working on that. And we are working on it, but what we think the future looks like. That's the, pie, the thing you should be going after. And that's also the easiest thing to go after because it's the agile, young underdogs. When I say young, I mean a state of mind, not, not age, that are the ones that are going to do that. We disrupted our industry and we're a bunch of dropouts that knew nothing, right? We, we took millions and hundreds of millions from the incumbents that have been doing marketing for 50 years, and we, you know, and we started with 2,000 pounds to our name, which it came from one guy I emailed on LinkedIn. So if you wanna, if you wanna win at, in the same way at the same speed, I'd be thinking, what's happening now in the world? And I promise you, it's right in front of you. In the same way that in 2011, when you posted on Facebook, you would get a million views, right? And brands still said, we, we don't wanna be on Facebook. They were still on TV and radio and all these other platforms because Facebook was just not the done thing. It wasn't the conventional thing. The reason we won was because we looked at that million views, the fact that we could get a Facebook page to a million likes in a day back then, we can't do it now. And we thought that is, if you ignore convention and what everybody's saying, that is interesting. Let's go after that. Sounds very easy, but it comes at a cost. And the cost typically is there's no blueprint. Right, you, you're the one writing the blueprint. And then I've, once I've written that blueprint, I get someone like yourself who'll stand up and say, how do I copy the blueprint? Don't. Go write a blueprint. And that's honestly my advice. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Have a question here. Good, good evening. Um, you mentioned about bringing your truth and ensuring that you speak your truth. However, how do you tackle times when you are around individuals who it's not as if you can escape them now. And if you bring forth, <laughs> if you bring forth your truth, it may affect not just your relationship with them, but probably support for future ventures and life in general as you may see it. This is a question that, no, like, this is a, the question was, how do you live your truth if you think that it's basically going to come at the cost of hurting someone close to you? There's a couple of points here. The first point is, A, no one can answer this question for you because the individual experience you have in your families, in your churches, with your, your work, no, no, no motivational speaker can stand up on this stage and give you a simple answer to that. If you start living your truth and it costs you your job and that means that your four kids can't eat, that's like dangerous, you know, naive advice to give. Here's what I will say about living your truth. Um, the really interesting phenomenon in my life is I can literally pinpoint the moments where I became more successful and happier perfectly correlate to the moments where I've been myself more. There was actually one day, this is probably the day that I became a public speaker. I was on stage in London, I was very, very tired, and I heard, I was sat on a panel of four speakers and a lady on the end of it said young people are so lazy right and normally up until then I was that like politically correct cozy public speaker that just would sit and wait for my turn and say what I think people wanted to hear for some reason I was very tired that day and I just went I got my microphone and I went what she just said was really offensive and the whole room went quiet <laughs> right and I'd never felt that before it was like the real Steve just stepped out for a second and I went home and I said, that's the most powerful I've ever been. <laughs> so from now on, when I get up on stage and people ask me questions, I'm going to speak my truth. And my, my career in all elements, in terms of our business and everything, went like this. And then as I said, I've, I read a lot into psychology. I studied psychology in my private time for about three years. And all the psychologists can show that any attempt to not live your truth, any attempt to abandon yourself, even if you're successful in abandoning yourself, or you fail, results in despair. If you succeed in abandoning yourself, right, and living someone else's life, you despair at abandoning yourself. If you fail, you fail, at, you, dis, you despair at failing to abandon your true self. And also, if you look at um, the studies they've done with punitive patients, patients are about to die. Bonnie Ware did an experiment where she went to people on their deathbed and said, what is your one biggest regret in your life? The number one biggest regret of the dying is not living a life that was true to themselves. And you get to 80 years old and you look back with this retrospective clarity and realize that you really wanted to be a ballet dancer, but your mother told you that that wasn't a real job. And the, the feeling of regret is, trust me, much, much greater than the risk 
of doing something or the perceived cost of failure. So that's what I will say. The, the decision of how much you live your truth has to be a personal one. No one should or can tell you how, how to navigate that because everyone's experiences are totally different. But I just wanted to express the importance of doing so. Thank you. Okay, keep those questions coming. Here's the opportunity. Please, we invite you to use it. Hi, Stephen. It's my turn? Okay. You mentioned LinkedIn. Yeah. I want to know, you were, you were able to get your first investor yeah. on LinkedIn? Yeah. I think, personally for me, I tend to overlook LinkedIn. Yes, you have a LinkedIn profile, but you don't really post on it. You mostly use Instagram, Facebook, yeah. the typical. Yeah. I want to know, what's your advice to... Yes. An entrepreneur who wants to really harness the power of LinkedIn in this age. Yep. So when I answered this gentleman's question here, I said that like the opportunity of social media has really passed. And I talked about how back in 2011, we could get a Facebook page to like a million followers in a day because of the way the algorithm worked. And if one person liked a page, it showed all of their friends they had, then all of their friends liked the page too. LinkedIn right now is the closest thing to what we were experiencing back then. You don't, you, know, you don't need to have a big following to go viral on LinkedIn. I'm gonna give, I've spoken a lot with the people that build LinkedIn. Um, so there's a couple of tips that I can give you. Okay, the first one is if you are a brand or a business, don't post from the brand's LinkedIn page. The algorithm is geared in such a way that when a CEO or an employee or a person posts, they will do two, three, four times the reach on their posts versus the company. My company can have the same amount of followers on LinkedIn. I will do three to four times the reach because LinkedIn want the platform to be about people, not about companies. So they've designed the algorithm that way. The second thing I'll say, which is really unique to LinkedIn, is on other platforms, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, the type of content you post really matters. So video works best over here, text works best here, photos work best here. Honestly, on LinkedIn, everything works great. And also, my best performing posts, if you go on my LinkedIn after this to check, my best performing posts in the last two months, and I post seven times a day on LinkedIn because I'm really bullish on it, are just sentences. Three or four sentences. I'll make a big video with my team which takes us two weeks, and if I write three sentences on the morning on LinkedIn, it will do 100,000 views on the post. Especially, and this is how you kind of game LinkedIn, if it's heavy on emotion, and also, LinkedIn is a platform that really benefits from like success stories. The way LinkedIn is working is every time someone comments on your post or likes it, it shares it with all of their connections as well. So every single time you post on LinkedIn, if you don't end it with a question mark, you are missing an opportunity. Everything you post on LinkedIn has to be a question. Because every comment, if I comment on your LinkedIn post, you get 20,000 views. I'm not guessing. I'm not, that's not a guess. In our company, when our directors post, we have a group, and we say, go. We all comment. Every time I comment, it goes up by 20,000 views. So when you're writing your LinkedIn posts, you need to make sure, they end with, but that is also a piece of advice that spans all social platforms, because on Instagram, it works the same way. The amount of comments you get, the amount of likes, drives up the amount of reach you get. So on all my posts on Instagram, you will not find one in the last three years that isn't a question in the caption. And yeah, LinkedIn, I'm just super bullish on. The other thing which is super interesting is um, podcasting. Mega, mega interesting. And year on year for the last eight years, social media reach has almost halved. I had a graph which I actually took out of this presentation because it was pretty long, um, which showed the amount that reach had halved on social media this year. And it's, it's about 49%. If that continues to happen, where is social media going? Halving every single year. You're spending more and more money getting likes and followers, and the reach is halving before your eyes. It's halving because they're putting more ads into the newsfeed, and more ads means your posts get less real estate. The other reason it's halving is because people are spending more time on stories than they are in the newsfeed. Last year was the first year in recorded history where stories overtook the newsfeed as the number one way that we share things with friends. I sit on a panel at Facebook, I have that data. And this has meant, again, that they have to put more ads in to keep their revenues going up, and it's a tricky time. So the, it, the conclusive point here is, it's almost like it's gone full circle. And the most important thing to me is now email again. 
have owning the data, because I spent a long time, I've got two million followers across my social media channels, I can reach maybe 70,000 of them if I post the link, right? It took me 10 years to get to the point I had two million followers, and I can reach 70,000. Next year, it'll probably be about 35,000. So while I can still reach them, I need their data. I need their email addresses. I've launched something which is called community.com, which is, for me, the future of social media, which is a text service. So if you go on my Instagram, you'll see my phone number all over my Instagram. That's another social network called Community, where if you text me, I get all of your details, and I can speak to you directly without Facebook in the way. And it's, it's like it's coming full circle. And if you're a brand or a marketer or a personal brander, you need to be on your email list. You need to be building your email list, any you know, phone number list and all those kinds of things. I can't even remember what the question was. LinkedIn, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and to underscore LinkedIn, that's exactly how, I, how we found Stephen. So um, awesome, awesome. Yes, it was, wasn't it? That's why I'm here. Yes, there you go. Okay, there's a hand here in the middle. Can I, there she is. Could you stand for me, please? I don't know. Katie, can you reach her? Are you... Are, are you can you project? I mean, we're, gonna, we're trying to reach you. Don't worry. Hold on. We're coming. We're coming. There we are. All right. Very good presentation. I enjoyed it. Hello. <laughs> um, my question is, um, when do you know when to bring other people in? When do you stop to say, all right, I can't do everything by myself. Mm. Um, I need to pull someone in to, to work on this business with me. Um, so, so typically, like the, 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 simple, the question was, when do you know when to bring someone into your business? I, the, typically, you want to, it gets to a point where you become a bottleneck for your own growth. You become the barrier to your own growth. And what tends to happen is it can go one of two ways. If you bring people in too early, you go bankrupt, right? It's what a lot of, the problem with a lot of businesses. It's also the problem with Silicon Valley and the tech world right now where the culture is raise loads of investment, Right? Spend it all on hiring people in a big office, and then they run out of money because they don't get to the point where they're breaking even or cash flow positive by the time the money runs out. The worst, the other thing you can do, which is really bad, is refuse to bring on support because of one of two things. And this is something you typically see in young entrepreneurs. The first is your own ego. And this is something, when I say young entrepreneurs, I almost had this problem when I started. I was 18 years old, and I couldn't I couldn't understand how I could hire like a 35-year-old with experience and still be their boss. So I, I went and hired a bunch of kids, right? Because I, it's somewhere in my sort of insecure little brain, I thought, you know, I can be, the, you know, I can lead kids, but I, 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 no 35-year-old with experience is going to want to come and work for me as a 19-year-old, 18-year-old CEO. That was one of the biggest mistakes I made, right? It was one of the things that probably stood the greatest chance of making me go bankrupt. Um, and, and the, 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 other, the other point on that, which is connected, is at some point in your own business, you will become the bottleneck to your own growth. You will be doing too many things, um, and typically a lot of things that you're not actually that good at. A lot of people won't be that good at finance in their business. They won't be good at um, administrative tasks. Your key as a CEO, my job now, even though we have 700 employees, is I just try and do the one thing that I know I'm best at as much as I can. And the one thing that I feel within my business, I'm uniquely positioned to do. The thing I think no one else can do, I try and spend most of my time doing that thing. And I have people that run my whole company that do everything else that I can't do. And they're so much better than me to the point where they tell me what to do. And I think that's also the, the humility you need to succeed. So again, it's a personal answer based on your business. But um, you'll get to a point where you feel that bottleneck. And you've just got to, you know, the, the key thing is making sure that you know you're spending as much time as you can doing the thing you are uniquely value, valuable at. And that brings the most value to the company. And try and outsource everything else to people that are more skilled. Thank you, Stephen. There's a question from the lady over here, point zero zero. But <laughs> <laughs> we know that's not it right now. Not right. All right. So it's interesting. So based on what you do, so you're pushing a lot of um, content, etc. So I'm thinking about securing your company in terms of maybe lawsuits or so is there has there ever been an instant where you because you're sharing pushing a lot of things for persons that somebody could actually come back at the company maybe because there's something that was 
shared that has come back against them in a negative way? How, how do you protect your company? Um, so the, the question was, you know, when you, when you put so much content out into the world, you're obviously going to get backlash, right? And I mean, like, this is life, right? When you put yourself out there, you're going to get backlash. And, and that just can't okay. stop you from doing what you do every day. You've got to operate with, and this, again, is, a, is both the answer to your question and a philosophy for life. You operate every day with a set of values. You try and be a good person. And, and that, for me, is enough. I was saying earlier in one of the pre-interviews I did that the, um, the endeavor to be more than yourself is, you know, is depression and anxiety and overthinking and worry and how and why people fall into themselves and don't do anything with their lives. My philosophy every single day with my company and with myself is I know I can do this much, right? And I get up every day and I try and do that much and I don't worry about anything more. And it's the same with our businesses. We try and be good people. We operate with a set of values and upon time we'll make mistakes. And when we do, going back to the point of transparency, we'll say that was a big mistake. We'll own up to it and we'll say how we'll try and be better in the future. That's a philosophy for life, business, relationships <laughs> and everything in between. Thank you, Stephen. So we're going to take a question here, and then we come back to the gentleman who is over there. So we'll take this a question here, then we come back over. Thank you. Good afternoon. Hey. My, right here. There she is. Hey. Yes. Okay. My major takeaway from your presentation is that I have to go out there and create my own love. So here I am trying to create that love. How does a third-year logistics... I'm sorry, could you hold the mic up closer? Thank you, um, oh, to your mouth, so we can hear you. How a does a third-year logistics and supply chain management student, at, like myself, be a part of the social chain? And follow-up question is, how does um, the, the social chain, how does it impact small businesses or prospective businesses? The question that I believe is, how does a small business use social chain? Yeah? Just clarify the question for him, please. Because I'm sorry, I wasn't hearing Okay, clearly. how does the common man become a part of the social chain? And what opportunities are there for prospective? Katie, could you help us? I'm sorry, we're not. All right, so she's asking, good afternoon, everyone. She's asking, how does the common man be a part of the social change? Social chain, <laughs> thank you. That's amazing. Thank you. That's the first part of her question. It's a two-part question, and the second part, you can As a job? Me. You want a job? <laughs> <laughs> can I have a job, is the question. <laughs> you want a job? Okay. Sorry? I can't hear you. She's if, serious. It's if you want situation. a job, um, I'll give you a try. <laughs> don't ask, you don't get, right? Okay. Welcome to Social Chain. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Or change, social change. Pandora's box has been opened. I'm kidding. The company, you have to send me an email. My email address is <laughs> steve at socialchain.com. And we'll sort it out. Steve at socialchain.com. Thank you. You're all going to send emails now. Yeah, I'm going to send. Pandora's <laughs> box <laughs> has been opened. OK? <laughs> Harry? <laughs> Sorry. This gentleman here, there, sorry, Kerry, sorry, there was a second part to her question <laughs> that we have a gentleman who wants to know the answer before we move on. There, there was a two-part question. It was a two-part question. Right. Did you get the second part, Stephen? Part. Right. I'm sorry, I don't know if Stephen got the second part of the question. Hi, good evening, everyone. Good evening, Stephen. Lovely evening. presentation. Right, so she, had, she mentioned a second part of her question. She asked, basically how do small businesses benefit from social chain and how social chain impacts businesses on a local level. So I know you have clients like Apple, mm -hmm. uh, Amazon, but does oh, social yeah. chain target smaller businesses and how um, do you go about doing that? So I th the question was in essence, like how does, how does 
small businesses benefit from social chain. We, to be honest with you, and I don't think a lot of people will say this, like working with social chain if you're a small business isn't a good idea because the way that the company's set up is to, you, you have a team of like eight to 10 people working on the brand minimum, right? That's how the company is set up. And in order to have eight to 10 people at social chain working on the brand, it takes, it's expensive, right? It's, it's not the most cost-effective way to market yourself if you're a small business. What I would do is come to conferences like this and other social media conferences and learn from people like social media CEOs the, the philosophy, the approach. That's why I talk about first principles and the mindset, and then take that into your business. And the most important thing you can do, irrespective, I could just sit up here for days talking about strategic things as a small business that you can do. The most important thing as a small business you can do is increase the amount of experiments that you're, that you're carrying out. Because when you, if you think back to my story, handing out flyers, leaflets, there was tons of other things we tried. These social media pages was maybe idea 50 or 60 or whatever once we'd run out of money, but it was the experimentation that got us there. And because of that mindset, I've actually told all of our global teams and all of our managing directors that our strategy, our official company strategy is experimentation. That's it. It literally says experimentation is our strategy. And that means I have a, a group in my pocket right now with all my company directors in called Move Fast and Make Things where someone comes up with an idea and we quickly just try and test it. Most of the time we fail. Sometimes we don't. And on those one or two occasions when you don't, it changes the game for you. And that's kind of what I think. I think, like, I come to hotels and, I, you know, um, every experience I have, and it's almost like everybody's read the same book. Like, you walk up to the hotel, they give you this plastic card, you go up to your room, you check in, thing in your room, there's little, like, little swan made out of whatever in your bed. Everybody's like, like, genuinely, think about it. Every experience is so similar. And it isn't until someone comes along, like the iPhone, in a world of Blackberries and you know, key, keyboards and things, and they create a completely different experience that you get these gigantic winners, and Apple you know, became the most va highly valued company in the world. That was an experimentation. Steve Jobs said, we're gonna remove the keyboard. The people at, there's actually a video of Steve Ballmer, the CEO of their competitor, saying they're gonna sell phones for $700 without a keyboard. You can watch it on YouTube, and he bursts out laughing. He goes, good luck to them. That's Apple he's talking about. And Jeff Bezos, the CEO and founder of Amazon, again, this is part of where I got the strategy from, has on their walls that the business model of Amazon is experimentation. Experimentation large is a philosophy. It's not something you have to pay for. It's a philosophy you instill in your teams. And in the case of Amazon, they experimented with the Kindle, that smash hit product. They've experimented with the voice activated device. You probably don't know the hundreds of gadgets and businesses that they experimented with that failed, but I guarantee you know all the ones that didn't. And that's, for me, is the simplest thing, is like, if you just ex did 10, ex like 10 ex experiments more a week, I wouldn't need to tell you any tips or tricks or tactics, because you would find them out for yourself and for your own business. Thank you. Gentlemen over here. Yeah, the mic, the mic. Mm -hmm. I remember New York. What? Yeah. <laughs> Got to the chase. <laughs> okay, so this, so this guy. Um, <laughs> met him. He's been following me. Um, I, uh, we met, he messaged me on Instagram three years ago and said, asked if he could come and meet me. So I said, yes, come to my office. He, came, he was in New York. He came to my office in New York, and we had a conversation in New York. And he's saying, how can I get on my podcast? Um, okay, here's what we're going to do. Hmm. What, you, do you run a business? And what, what, where are you at with your business at the moment? So, so give me some numbers, some metrics. All right, so right now we employ students across the island for jobs and employment Okay. I don't think the mic is working, but Katie, Katie's on her yeah, there's way. There's one behind you. There's Here one behind she is. you. Here okay. she is. Okay. So right now we have an impact of 2,000 students. We place over jobs and opportunities across the island and the Caribbean. 
um, full-time jobs, part-time jobs, and just work youth development, really. Sure. So that's our impact. Do you, are you for profit? Yes. How, and give me a ballpark. I know there's, there's a lot of people here, but <laughs> <laughs> give me a ballpark figure of the revenue you're making. All right, so in 2018, we made 30 million Jamaican dollars in revenue. Good, well done. In um, pounds, how much is that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so my podcast is called... 2,000 pounds, okay, fine. So in my podcast is called The Diary of a CEO, and what we do is we get some of the world's best CEOs on to tell their stories. We don't always want CEOs that are the biggest. We're t typically looking for the great stories. So what I'll say to you is when you get to um, 100, you're at 30 now, when you get to 100, and if you can prove to me that you've um, donated at least 5% of your profits to social causes, on that day, I will fly you to the UK, to our office out there, which is our big headquarters with hundreds of people and stuff, and we'll film the podcast there, but you have to be able to prove that to me. Very impactful okay? presentation. I think, to be honest, I was, like, speechless. Mm. Because I'm, like, you know, when you reach late 20s and I'm, like, you think you accomplished something and then you hear your story and you're like, man, you're nowhere near that. So I really felt um, impacted and kind of feeling emotional. Um, but one of the things I want to ask you is how is it you were able to persuade all of those persons to come on board and give up their social media pages? Because I'm like, that's crazy. So what did you, what was the script that you, you said to them? You know, what was it that, is it just the power of self-belief? Because, yeah. you know, you speak a lot about that. Yeah. So I'm kind of curious as to what, you know, you said to them to really get them to drop out of school and come and follow you and give up everything. Mm. Like, so the, the answer to, to the question is, um, it's, it's like, the, so I was told before this presentation that a lot of people in Jamaica, um, specifically younger graduates, do take up like call center jobs. Yeah. So the thing that I didn't tell you in this presentation is throughout Warpark, when I was trying to build that website for those three years, the, I worked in every call center you could imagine. I worked in call centers from the age of 16 years old to about 20, 20 years old. And what the call center experience, you know, young Jamaicans will think that that's a totally pointless endeavor or it's a dead end job. But what call center experience taught me was the unbelievable power of sales. My job was to call people, usually at nighttime, and sell them something they did not want or need. So I'm calling, you know, Joanna, 72-year-old Joanna, and trying to sell her conservatories, windows, and doors. Um, she's telling me to F off, and <laughs> I'm trying to diffuse that situation and still trying to sell her a new window. Um, and you do that for four years, and you get pretty you know, akin at so So, like, these, these are some of the most important jobs because sales is everything. Sales, is, sales isn't just getting someone to buy something. Sales is what that guy just did when he stood up. Sales is you go to a nightclub and you see a girl or a guy that you like the look of. Sales is when you're on a plane and the manners you give the, the flight attendant and she gives you one more bottle of water because you were smiling. Sales is every interaction in the world, and it is, it is the case because the only thing that stands in the way of you becoming the, like the leader of Jamaica and or a, the world's greatest philanthropist or me becoming prime minister, if you think about it, the only thing is a bunch of people, right? And a bunch of people that you need to convince of your opinion in the political sense or whatever. Uh, and so when you think about the world as, you know, we think about these, like, it's some, like, these physical obstacles. It's really just a bunch of people. And so the, the, the most important skill, therefore, to knock down that obstacle, which is a bunch of people, is getting really good at sales. And um, I've, I've been good at sales because I was working in call centers since I was 16, you know, doing 100 calls a shift, working in, you know, night shifts when I was 20, picking up phones, selling hotels, whatever, fake grass, whatever they would make, want me to sell. And that allowed me to sharpen my sword. And then the other thing, which is super important, is it's much easier to sell something that you believe in, right? And I really believed in myself. And that comes across. It comes across today. It come, came across to Dom in that pub six years ago. It came across to the guy that called me from LinkedIn. It came across to every investor I secured since then. I've secured 15 investors, all of them investing in a kid saying some stuff. 
That's, again, for sales. And, it, and you can feel when I speak that I mean what I say. And, it, and, it, and it's, it's hard to argue against. It's often, for a lot of people, something they've wanted to, a direction they wanted to go in. A lot of people as well, they don't have a huge you know, amount of direction in their life. So they are seeking someone to come along and give them direction. And that's what kind of leadership really is. It's giving people a direction and giving them confidence and security and the belief that you can go in that direction and achieve that thing. And that's why, um, that's why I'm here. Thank you. Great question and great response. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm glad you made that call center reference, Stephen, because, I mean, it's a huge reality for us here in Jamaica as a, as a country like ours. It's a big um, business process, outsourcing, it's, it's the only job, other job I've ever had. Yeah. And, and actually, it was my first job out of yeah. university. Yeah. I couldn't get a job, and it was on my first job out of university. And, hey, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, selling Visa credit cards over the phone, calling people, selling a If credit this card. fails, I'll go back. I'll, yeah. <laughs> I'll go back then. Okay, so there's a lady here. Yes, lady in green. <laughs> right? No more jobs. No more jobs, no more podcasts, no more interviews. <laughs> so, um, hello, Stephen. Yeah. And a lovely presentation. Enjoyed every, every minute of it. Um, just getting into yourself, your head a little bit more. Um, what are some of the things that you do to center yourself mm -hmm. and, you know, kind of get into that creative <laughs> space? where you think about what's next and you strategize for your team and kind of slow things down? Or yeah, it's just really share great some empathy? Really great, really great question. Great question. Um, so it's kind of like two, two points there. So the first point is what do I do to like, you know, get out of the storm and think and those kinds of things. And quite honestly, I think a lot of you will relate to this. The majority of my ideas and thinking time comes in the shower and in the gym and when I'm walking. It's a trend that it's, it's almost a bit of a strange human phenomenon that some of our best ideas occur in the hallways and when we're shopping and when we're running on a treadmill. It's the same for me. One of the things I learned very on, early on was that those moments where you get clarity of mind and the inspiration is perishable. So when I'm running on that running machine and I'm thinking, do you know what? Yeah, I should have done that. I'll get off the treadmill machine and I'll write that down. Because the minute I get off the treadmill machine and I go back to the world, that idea, I can't really remember why, why I why I had it. So if you look at my phone now, what you'll see is tons and tons of voice notes to myself from when I've been on treadmills and running and on a bike or in a shower, where I've just said, Steve, okay, um, remember that this, da, 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 and you're thinking this because of this, 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 and make sure you do this, this, and this, and if you forget why, remember this, 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 da, 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 and, I, and I save those things, and then I act on that inspiration because I know that inspiration comes and goes, and it, it almost like fades out. Um, so that's where I get my, my clarity of mind, the same place most of us do, not in meetings or boardrooms or brainstorms. And the next point, which is a question you didn't ask, but I thought you were going to ask, was about how I relax, right? You, you know, my, especially when you run a social media business and a, a digital business, that never stops. You know, the work is, there's always a campaign happening around the world in one of the countries that our business is in. Um, I... I'm, I think I realized that very early on, I'd probably go insane if I didn't develop my own calm within any chaos. And especially as a leader of a business, where I know every day I wake up, 27 years old, there, I'm guaranteed to be greeted that day, early in that day as well, with some really dreadful news. Sometimes the worst news you could possibly imagine. I remember one particular day, 5 a.m. in the morning, I wake up, we're driving to work, it's our team building day, we're all going paintballing, look at my phone, our server's been hacked, my business partner's email has emailed all of our clients personal, very specific abuse about them, and they've made it look like he didn't mean to send them the email, like he meant to send it to his PA, but it accidentally copied them in. So on that day, I get to paintballing. We've got 100 of our employees there, super excited, jumping around, can't wait to get started, whatever. I know that we've just lost our business. My phone is ringing, and it's people telling me that I'm a coward for not admitting that we emailed them abuse. We didn't, obviously. We didn't email all 40 of our clients very specific abuse at 3 a.m. in the morning. But as far as our clients were concerned, that didn't matter. Someone had hacked us. So you can imagine being stood in front of 100 of your friends and colleagues, super excited, the most joyful day on planet Earth for our company, 
and having to try and figure out how you, A, let them know that they've lost all their business and their clients and the, the accounts that they manage, and also that we immediately need to leave and get back to the office. I was 23 years old, right? And, and you go through those moments, and um, if you persevere, you survive. And once you survived one, and then another one, and then another one, and then another one, next time one shows up, you have this retrospective hindsight clarity to know that like, we overcame last time, and it felt like this. It felt this bad in that moment last time. And, we're st and we, we, we came through that. And so that's allowed me to develop this total calm within chaos. And that also means that I don't get too carried away with good news either, right? So we can have the best news. We've just made, Coca-Cola have just signed a deal with us for 14 international markets. We can get that news come through, and I almost have to fake my excitement. Sounds like a bit of a sad thing to say, but this is a consequence of being unmoved to news broadly. And that means that on that day, I don't get too carried away. And on the day where I find out that we've been hacked and lost all of our clients, I don't move too much either. Because if I move with the news, my life is going to be absolutely chaos and there's going to be no peace. So as a leader, I think you have to get to the point where you detach yourself a little bit and you, you kind of see it as a game. I see it like a game of chess that I'm playing over here. And if we lose all of our pieces, it doesn't impact me, but I do care about the outcome of this game. And it's knowing how much to involve yourself. And again, that's a, that's a lesson for life more broadly because knowing what you should care about, knowing what to engage in, knowing which battles to fight is the, 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 probably the biggest predictor of your personal happiness. Most people are miserable because they're spending too much time caring about things that absolutely do not matter, that won't matter when they're on their deathbed, when they're looking back at their lives. It's the single biggest happiness mistake we make is caring about things that do not matter, about that person that said that thing about your hair, about so-and-so's opinion. You wouldn't care about these things if you had an hourglass on your desk and it showed in sand how much time you had left on this planet. That is the mindset that thinks they're going to live forever. Caring about things that don't matter, consuming an hour of your day, evolving your, your peace in situations that are beneath you. This is a separate point, but it's... Um, it's certainly interesting. Thank you. All right. Did I see a hand or a finger? Yes, Tamara. Hi, Tamara. Hi. I love your outfit. Thank you. Yes. Um, like a you tiger. Spoke... Pardon me? Like a tiger. Yes, Beautiful. thank you. Um, you spoke a lot about your mom mm -hmm. in the beginning. And in Jamaica, we have similar beliefs as your mom in terms of education being the way out, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, my question to you is, what advice would you give to a parent in mm -hmm. Jamaica in the mm -hmm. 21st century about not boxing in children and their creativity and all that they can be? So ah. here's the thing. Here's the, when, I, when I tell that story about my mother, the single biggest misconception, right, is that people think I don't value education, right? There's a big, you know, university is one way of getting education. There is nothing I value more than education. I read, spend more of my free time reading books and educating myself than anybody that I know. Education is the most important thing. It is liberation, right? What you know is, is, is the most important thing. The point is, and the reason why university wasn't right for me, is I thought and I believed that I could get the education I needed to become an entrepreneur by doing it because of the situation I was in. That's not always the case. I want my doctor to go and get a degree, right? <laughs> Please. Right? And so for that industry, the best way to get your education is going to university. Anybody that says otherwise is probably lying. I don't want my doctor to drop out and go out alone, you know? <laughs> you know? And, that, and so that's the biggest misconception. Ed, like, university is one form of education, but again, in a world where the, 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 the sum total of all recorded human history can be accessed from the palm of your hand, it, it begs the question why we need to spend, in the UK anyway, £30,000 a year right, for something, a piece of paper on the, the course I was doing that is now worth less than ever before. People, like all my friends, they, the, my friends that did the course, Mark, Mark, uh, Mike Barlow, who's, 
with Hannah Turley, who I talked about, is that my other best friend, Matt, completed that course. He's asking me for a job now. He did a couple of stints working in call centers, but it doesn't guarantee a job in this day and age. And I promise you, 700 employees, it's actually now about 900 because we bought a bunch of companies in December, but 700 employees, I can't tell you who has a degree, and I promise you that in our industry, and this is, goes back to the advice that I'd give you as a mum, because the world has changed, if your son or daughter came to me and they had three months experience doing the role that they're applying for, or they had a five-year degree, I promise you I will give your son the job for a three months experience in social media versus 10 years. Re How can you get a degree on social media? It changes every day. Books take three years to publish. So how, you know, and, and this is the thing, There's, you have to appreciate nuance across different industries. Um, and social media is one of those ones where the system isn't set up to be able to educate the next generation on an ever-changing landscape. Um, and, and so my last piece of advice, which I gave earlier on, was if I had a kid now and I was trying to make sure that they were equipped for the future, I would most certainly be putting them into school to study computer science and anything related to machine learning and artificial intelligence because the single biggest disruptor, as everybody predicts it, to the, the workforce and to the jobs and what the jobs of the future look like is machine learning and computers, right? The, the biggest employer, the biggest occupation in the world is driving, right? Delivery drivers, taxi drivers, and driving generally. That employs more people than any other thing. And that is the industry that is most susceptible, especially if you go out to the streets of San Francisco now. Those cars are driving themselves. There's no one in them. That's what's coming for the, the majority you know, of, of people. And um, the, 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 the debate that's happening in the tech industry at the moment is how are we going to deal with all these people that don't have jobs? I promise you. This is why people are saying we're going to give everybody a dividend. One of the, uh, the, the big political parties, the, the big political candidates running in America at the moment to be president, his whole platform is we're going to give everybody a thousand a month because AI and machine learning and technology is going to make most of Americans jobless. So that's where I'd be putting my kids is into technology and into specifically anything that relates to machine learning and artificial intelligence because it's a tremendous, tremendous advantage. Thank you. Great question. Great question. Okay, here's a finger in the middle. Hi. Hey. Hi. Really, really, really enjoyed your presentation. So I have a quick question. Being that you have experienced some level of success, right, especially early on, just so. Some level, so many some level, because I'm Seeing sure there's, there's, there's further to some go. Level of some success. level of success. So everybody's like, some. No, no, <laughs> so there's further for him to go. But being that you have ex um, you've experienced some level of success, how do you remain agile mm, instead of great, becoming great consumed question. with the fear of possibly losing it all? Like, how do you continue to take and those this is, risks? And yeah, it's a really great, great question. question. So the question was, um, seeing as you've experienced like some level of success, how do you remain agile? And the first thing, which none of you will believe when I say it, is everybody in this room probably thinks I'm successful other than one person. Your mother. Yeah. <laughs> no, me. Me. Nothing has changed in my life. Absolutely nothing. And that sounds cliche. It sounds like I'm lying. I don't feel any different in any way. I say it to my team all the time. I feel like I'm still that kid in that boarded up house in Moss Side that's just trying to get ahead. Things have changed in my material circumstances, obviously, but in my mind, nothing has changed. And it taught me this really, really valuable lesson about success generally, right? Which is when I grew up with nothing, I thought the day when I got um, loads of material wealth or whatever, I would be like astronomically more happy, that it would just keep going up and up and up the more stuff I got, right? And, and I thought, when I, when I got to the point where my company was worth a million and I bought that Range Rover that you saw in the picture, I thought though, like conf confetti was going to come from the roof, <laughs> Gen genuinely. Because as an insecure kid in a, in a, growing up in an area where I had nothing, it was the most important thing. It was the reason, money was the reason why I watched my mum and dad scream at each other every day. Every day. You know, we, it's not cool when you, you grow up in a very, fairly well-off area, but your house has smashed windows on it for two decades, and your grass is this high. And the car your parents drop you off to school in is making these explosive noises and has no paint on it. So my thing was, I can fix all my problems if I just achieve that goal. 
and I achieved the goal, and nothing changed. Obviously, you know, I'm not shoplifting food anymore like I was back in the day, but my fundamentals, my fundamentals, my ha nothing changed. And the science kind of supports this to some extent. It shows that there's a level of financial security you get to, which is important, and anybody that's, you know, successful in telling you that money doesn't matter is lying to your face. But once you get to that point, it doesn't matter. And then every single day, you're playing the game for different reasons. And really, it's something I've really never talked about on stage. The day at 25 years old, when someone approached me and said, we want to buy your company for 40 million. Do you want to sell? Go and think about it. It was one of the worst days of my life. I went home that day. An 18-year-old broke Steve showed up. And he went on the computer. He looked at fast cars, Lamborghinis, mansions in the countryside. And I remember being sat in the room in, in the bottom floor of my house, looking at these Lamborghinis and these cars, and thinking to myself, for some reason, I think if I get this massive mansion in the middle of nowhere with seven bedrooms and a tennis court, I'm going to be poorer in some degree, some sense. And do you know what I did? I did it. And I was right. I got this massive mansion with a tennis court in the middle of the countryside on a big hill, right, at 24 years old. We lived 40 minutes away from the office, but also 40 minutes away from all of our friends. We had more bedrooms. We had a house outside of our house, right? Worst decision I ever made. I didn't even last there. I was there for nine and a half months before I abandoned it and moved back into the city center with my friends in a one-bedroom apartment um, in the heart of it. And I had to learn that lesson. Some lessons in life you just have to learn. 18-year-old um, Steve was wrong. 26-year-old Steve, 27-year-old Steve now um, understands that I'm not playing for, for, for cash or for... Um, to impress anybody anymore. I'm playing for a bunch of other things. This year, we've donated a million pounds to charity, which is something we're, like, mega proud of. We've, um, we've, um, we've, we've laid out this great path to make social chain carbon neutral so we're not impacting the environment. And really, when I reflect on the things that make every day when I wake up wor worthwhile, it's so clear that the most selfish thing that I can do is to give, which was this crazy paradox. Like, I can spend 1000 or 5000 on a bag for myself, and I'll get meh. But giving my niece a toy or giving my mum new teeth because her teeth had rotten was the single most rewarding thing in my career. Like, and that, you know, and so that, that, I had to go through that to learn that. And so today, you know, we, we play, I'm playing this game for a different set of reasons. Yeah. Thank you. Great question and great answer. All right. So we have... One last time for one last question. There's a hand right there in the shadows. I also sold my Range Rover and bought a bicycle. So, actually, <laughs> so I don't have a car anymore. Okay, hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thoroughly enjoyed your presentation. Uh, but a lingering question on my mind has been, how would you, what advice would you give to someone who is in the initial stages of launching their own business, um, a passion project, but you have a, not a nine to five, really a nine to 10, 11. Um, and we have a small amount of time. <laughs> and you have a small amount of time to like really invest in your thing. But at the same time, you are reaping some value from your nine to 11, that can be transferred over into what you yeah. want to do. Yeah. But I don't want to experience burnout, and I'm, you know, sure. going up to work. Sure, yeah, yeah. Okay. So what advice would you give to cool. kind of just balance it up? So I'm right in thinking the question is, what advice would you give to someone starting a business or a passion project? Yeah. They've got a job. They haven't got a huge amount of time. Yeah. Cool. Um, so I was that person. I was, I was starting Wall Park. I was working uh, in late rooms call centers, selling hotel rooms. And like the bad advice you get to that question is just quit and, and go for it, right? The, the, the good advice, I think, and the good answer to that question is like be practical. Like if you've got kids in a mortgage, quitting your job and running after a dream is probably not like a good idea. And that's like, again, it's not particularly revolutionary advice, but it's the most important thing. You have to be practical with yourself and you have to maximize the free time that you do have and hopefully get yourself to the point where you can let go, like a monkey swinging through a jungle, of the last branch in time to grab hold of the next one. That's what I did. I actually got fired from Late Room's call center um, 
for what they called gross misconduct because they caught me on my phone designing my website and pretending to talk. <laughs> <laughs> So they, they, they call me into the room and they play back, because it, apparently it's all recorded. So they played back me having a conversation with myself. <laughs> and they said I was fired. And that's what I was doing. I was, the answer is you've got to balance the two and you've got to be practical with your own personal in, uh, situation. Thank you. Thank you. Another round of applause for Thank Stephen. Thank you so much.